This is the Sitecast by MD Edge. And welcome to episode 161 of the Sitecast by MD Edge. If you'd like any more information about our guest or our guest host, you can find that in the show notes. There will be links and an outline to the topics provided, authored by Dr. Jacqueline Posada. Okay, without any further ado, let's get to this week's episode. Hi, I'm Dr. Eva Ridfo. I'm a member of the Editorial Advisory Board for the Clinical Psychiatry News, and I'm a psychiatrist in private practice in Miami Beach, and I'm so excited to be here today with Dr. Dorothy Lewis. Um, Dr. Lewis is a very longtime friend of mine, and in fact, I credit her for bringing me to the field of psychiatry. When I was 18 years old, I went to New York City from Los Angeles, and she was my mentor for the summer, and she was such an extraordinary woman back then that I decided to follow her, as well as, of course, two parents and multiple aunts, uncles, and cousins into the field of psychiatry. So it's such a pleasure to be here with Dorothy today. Um, for those of you who don't know, Dr. Dorothy Lewis is a very esteemed American psychiatrist with a long and distinguished career. Um, she was educated at Harvard Radcliffe undergraduate, went to Yale Medical School. She did both her um, child and adult psychiatry training at Yale, and she has spent her career on the faculty of both Yale and NYU. In addition, she has been married to esteemed psychiatrist Mel Lewis, and together they have two children and she continues to live in New Haven. Uh, today, we are together because of very exciting news, which is that Dr. Dorothy Lewis is now the subject of a documentary. And she, um, it was released recently and reviewed in the New York Times, we'll provide the links. And she um, is here today to talk to us about the experience of being in a documentary, as well as her long and important career and her contributions to the field of psychiatry. She knows we're with a group of clinicians today, so I hope that we will all leave here today knowing how to treat um, our patients and uh, patients of, of our colleagues in a more humane and holistic fashion. So Dr. Lewis, thank you so much for being here today. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here and to see you. Great, it's now on Zoom I can, I can actually see you, that's wonderful. Yeah. Um, so, so tell us, how did this come about that you uh, became the subject for this documentary? I ask myself the, <laughs> the very question. Um, I had received a call uh, oh, in, 19, in 2016 from, uh, from the director, producer, Alex Gibney. And he was, uh, he had heard that I worked with uh, death row inmates and very violent people. And he was uh, planning to do a mini series with Laura Dern on a woman psychiatrist who sees a uh, man on death row. And so uh, it's not a large field, <laughs> Eva. You know, he does have a big sort. Uh, but uh, anyway, I came down, I met with him. And then a few weeks later, I came down, I met with him and Laura Dern, and I brought a lot of my tapes from interviews with particularly interesting uh, patients, some of them on death row, some of them at Bellevue. And uh, I just showed them these tapes uh, to give Laura a sense of, you know, what, a, what I sounded like, what they sounded like. And shortly thereafter, Alex said, I want to do a doc on you. And it was wow. after seeing the, those videos and I was blown away. I mean, wow. Uh, so, uh, that's what he and I have been working together for the past four years, I guess. And uh, in the meantime, he has put out so many wonderful documentaries already that, uh, you know, you. I, I think his most brilliant one is Taxi to the Dark Side, but also Going Clear. And he's been dubbed like the most important uh, documentary maker of our century or something like that. Uh, he's a very, very skilled guy. And so I said, sure, go ahead. And that's how it started. Wow. So it's called Crazy Not Insane. 
and tell us how do you feel about about it now that it's here after all these years of, of work? Well, uh, I didn't see it until relatively recently. It was supposed to premiere at the South by Southwest Film Festival last March 12th. And by that time, COVID had arrived and the uh, festival was canceled. And eventually last summer, it showed at the Venice Film Festival. And then uh, it didn't come here until I think November 18th or so. And uh, that's when I got to see it. And I think Alex is brilliant. I think that uh, he, uh, he has a sense of the artistry and the uh, just uh, the entire film, if you if you recall it, it has uh, an incredibly artistic and coherent uh, frame to it, and I'm just honored to have been the topic of it. Uh, it it's a remarkable piece, and it, I think it really did do justice to the work that you've done, which I think has been extraordinary. Can you share with our um, viewers who might not have seen the movie, a little bit about what your life profession has been dedicated to? Sure. Uh, well, I, uh, one moment. I started out, uh, I started my child psychiatry training at the Yale Child Study Center. <clears throat> and I was supposed to be studying in the pre-K uh, unit and it was really not interesting. So I got the powers that be to allow me to sit in at the juvenile court. And uh, that's where I got started because I started to see kids who had been uh, referred to court for various and sundry crimes and who had uh, psychiatric and neurological problems that had never been addressed and who had parents who were often extremely disturbed in one way or another with, uh, we had many psychotic parents, bipolar parents, a lot of parents that had a lot of difficulties. So I started a clinic at, uh, at the court. And then after that, I worked at the, uh, at the child uh, detention center, which was a very closed uh, facility and saw violent kids there, and then uh, went on to NYU. And we had just published a paper on the children who were uh, hospitalized on our child unit, which meant under 12 years of age, in a given year. And I had only been looking at that because I was wondering about medical problems. And to my amazement, it turned out 50% of the kids had been homicidal. Now these are children under 12 and I did not expect that. And uh, so we looked into that and we, uh, and we published that. And I was interviewed on the news about that article and a, um, a public defender, Dick Burr, uh, saw the, uh, the newscast. And the next thing I know, I think the next day I got a call from him and he said, I have a client on death row in Florida who sounds exactly like your, uh, like the kids you've written about. Would you be good enough to come down to Florida and examine him? And so I said, sure. And I went down and I examined him. And by God, he was right. There was a history of hideous abuse in his family. And also there were some psychotic symptoms, some neurologic symptoms. And I wrote, wrote it up. And then not long thereafter, he called again for a different uh, client of his and a murderer. And I came down and I saw him. And the thing I remember about him is uh, he had a dent in his skull where his father had run over his head with a horse and buggy. And clearly he had neurolo very serious neurologic problems and psychiatric difficulties and family difficulties. I guess if you run over your child with a horse and buggy, it's not good. So uh, I did that. And then Dick Burr and I started to think, my God, if we, two out of two of his uh, sample 
had this constellation, we should look into uh, just a random selection of people on death row and find out is this common or is it just by accident? And that's how I got into that. And we, were, we managed to scrape up funds to, uh, so that I could bring a neuropsychologist and a neurologist, and eventually we did EEGs. Uh, and we did a study of adults condemned to death. And by God, they looked very much like the children at Bellevue. So that's how I got into it. Hmm. And w what year was that study done, approximately? That, that study, I think, I'm not sure if it was published in 86, maybe, 1986. Yeah. Uh, it could have been before then, could have been a, a bit before then. Uh, but it was certainly in the 1980s. Right, yeah. right. And how many death row inmates did you study? Well, in that group, uh, we, by the way, we, uh, we tried to get all of the inmates we could get in different states, and it was not that easy to do. Uh, so I think in that sample, there were maybe 15 or so. Mm -hmm. And uh, subsequently, I got a very small grant uh, to study juveniles who had been condemned to death. And I think that's when I really got hooked because uh, we, I had this team together and we went to four different states. Actually, we would have gone anywhere they allowed us, but we could only get entry to four different states. And we saw all of the inmates on death row who had been sentenced to death as juveniles. And so uh, it was, you know, it wasn't a selected group in the sense of selecting for mental illness or for neuro neurologic problem. It was just this group were all of the juveniles in that particular state. And that sample had about 14. And we published that. And then uh, a, a law firm, I believe, did a brief to the Supreme Court using our findings, because uh, there was a case questioning the uh, constitutionality of sentencing juveniles to death. And so that was quoted in their decision. And that was, uh, I'm not sure, it was certainly in the, in the mid eighties or around that time. And uh, then again in 2004, uh, I think it was requested, I'm not sure if it was by Doctors Without Borders or but it was by a, uh, a nonprofit group uh, to see if we could repeat that study uh, on juveniles under the age of 18, because the first, uh, the first article had been used in the case of Thompson v. Oklahoma and Wilkins, I think, v. Missouri, uh, to abolish the death penalty for children under the age of 17. And our second study in 2004, I think it might have been published in 2005, was uh, the issue was, could you sentence juveniles under the age of 18 to, uh, to death? And uh, we were able to, to get, I think it was the entire population of, uh, of juveniles condemned to death in Texas. So it was an unselected group. And, uh, and we published that. And I'm told that it was used uh, in the uh, Simmons v. Roper case, which was uh, when the Supreme Court said that uh, it would be unconstitutional to, uh, to sentence a child under 18 to death. So I can die happy if that's, <laughs> if that's all that gets, uh, you know, that gets changed because with that decision, 70 kids were immediately off death row. And of course, you no know, more were allowed to go. So it was, it's rare because I, I have a mortality rate. Uh, you know, I'm one of the few psychiatrists who does because a lot of the kids and the adults have been executed. And here was a time when 70 kids were, had their sentences commuted and were not killed. 
That's extraordinary. And then were these kids funneled into a, a treatment system or do they remain? At your, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I No, I don't think they were funneled into treatment. They just were not executed. Uh -huh. I mean, uh, it's very, very, well, as I'm sure you know, it's very, very hard to get any child into a treatment facility. And uh, the only thing, that, what the Supreme Court did is it said, you, you are not allowed to sentence a juvenile to death. But then, uh, you know, that's for your generation to go ahead and change. Now you have to change how they treat them. So, uh, so you, you see your, long career as bringing this problem to the surface and identifying a whole host of factors that contribute to the violence. And you're gonna leave the baton to the next generation to try to figure out how to treat that. Is that correct? Well, I kind of have to, because I'm in my eighties. So that I, uh, of course <laughs> I have to leave it to you guys. But, but you um, don't look like you're in your eighties. Well, I am. and. Uh, <laughs> You know, if I could, if I could get a really big grant in a big hurry, uh, I would try to do a prevention study. Uh, you know, my colleague Catherine Yeager and I uh, have worked together and have uh, thought about doing a study uh, in in school, whether you can identify things like in kindergarten, where you can, if you can identify the children there who are being abused. That's all that, uh, you know, that we would want to look at at the time. Uh, there would be an opportunity to give assistance to these families and to help prevent ongoing recurring violence. So that would, if I could only have a grant to do one thing, I would do uh, an early identification and prevention of child abuse. Uh, and the treatment, the trouble is, you know, we're not, terribly good at treating violence, don't you think? It, uh, it, uh, and it isn't one size fits all. With, with the kids that we treated, we were so, we worked so gingerly, in, like in detention in terms of medication, in terms of programs, in terms of uh, therapy. Um, it's a big task. Yeah, it's a huge task. Yeah. What would you urge clinicians to start to pay more attention to? Uh, well, I think first I would abolish the diagnosis conduct disorder. Okay. Uh, because conduct disorder is like a throwaway term or a, or a kind of almost a, I really hate this kid term. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because it, at least in my experience, Every single disorder, with very few exceptions anyway, in early childhood manifests itself as uncontrollable conduct. I mean, whether you have a bipolar kid, if you have a psychotic kid, surely if you have a brain damaged kid, and even if you have an abused kid, uh, you will see that uh, they fit the broad category of conduct disorder. So you get nowhere with that as a diagnosis. Uh, and well, that's where I would begin. I begin by kind of educating colleagues who go into child psychiatry to look further, ask more questions, find out about the family. I mean, you find out that so many of the families have had alcohol problems, have had uh, mood disorders, have had psychoses and uh, find out what are the vulnerabilities of the child you're seeing? What are the vulnerabilities that make him or her violent? And try to address them. And if it's in the household, you need social service. It's funny, it parallels the, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement now where they send police to do the work of social workers and psychiatrists. You know? uh, and I think that's what happens uh, to children as well. Yep. So we need a lot more resources directed at these children that are, are, are showing symptoms early on. Well, I think you need a more sophisticated evaluation. And, uh, you know, if psychiatrists did not have 
that DSM, God knows what, conduct disorder as a possibility, then they would have to look at all of these other disorders. Uh, by the way, this goes also for antisocial personality disorder because uh, that is a bit of a throwaway term where you know, if someone has done something heinous and he's done it before, whatever, he will uh, fit the, the category of antisocial personality disorder. But if you do a more careful diagnostic evaluation, and if you ask all of the questions that have to do with mood, with, uh, with psychotic symptomatology, certainly with paranoia, uh, you find that uh, fewer and fewer of these, let's say inmates or whoever it is, uh, fewer and fewer are simply antisocial personality disorder. Uh, that, but it's such an easy thing. Uh, it often means I really hate this patient. And uh, mm. this is my I, experience. I'm, I'm not sure I have anybody who agrees with me. I know from watching the movie that dissociative disorder was something that you saw in a number of these death row inmates. Can you talk yeah. about that? Sure. Uh, the, well, first of all, one of the reasons that uh, you saw so many of those patients uh, is not because they make up the greatest number of people who murder other people. And that's very important to make clear. The reason that we had videos of them is we only videoed when, uh, when we felt the person had a disorder that no one would believe. And of course, dissociative identity disorder is a very controversial disorder. And so uh, our, uh, our filming was skewed toward people who won't believe what they see, you know, unless they see it. Um, it uh, I don't know whether it is more common in the uh, criminal population. I have seen it certainly in more than one uh, serial murderer. And uh, well, it makes sense because it starts so early and seems to start from early ongoing intolerable abuse. And the kid seems to space out and it's as if it's happening to someone else. And uh, then it becomes a habit of mind. And uh, so it will happen again and again. Uh, but that, that is a skewed population in that movie because we, you know, we didn't take, uh, we didn't take films of people with just uh, bipolar disorder, or, uh, uh, paranoid personality disorder, because uh, we felt, you know, that's pretty well established and that you could present it in court. But with DID, if they don't see it, they don't believe it. And if they do see it, they don't believe it. Um, so that's why you got those. But, uh, you know, I don't know the proportion of uh, death row inmates with that disorder. What was the most common diagnosis amongst your death row inmates? Um, damned if I know. Uh, oh, I'm sure you were, we worked together, didn't we? <laughs> Trying to figure out what makes this group different, right? Uh, and we sorted out, uh, you know, the, our uh, serial killers, for example. Uh, and to this day, I, I've never been able to find something that was more characteristic of serial killers, let's say, than your average run-of-the-mill, very violent person. So we've never published on it because we didn't see a big difference. Mm -hmm. And, um, it, you know, it isn't because it isn't there, but we missed it. Mm -hmm. or, or maybe it isn't there. Maybe it isn't there, yeah. Right, right. So interesting. So what are some of the other important areas for clinicians to look at um, and in, a, in their practice, as well as from a research standpoint that you want to leave to the next generation? You mentioned prevention. Oh, that you is mentioned digging into the diagnoses. Yeah. 
Well, uh, let me tell you how I kind of got to do the kind of uh, evaluation that we do. And I know you know it because we worked together and you had your own interesting patients. Um, when I was first doing this work, I was studying for boards in psychiatry. And uh, so I was taking very, very careful medical histories and family histories, which usually uh, that was not done in the juvenile court, but we did it. And when you asked these medical kinds of questions, uh, and you have to know how to ask them, but when you ask them in a non-threatening, more accepting way, you, uh, you discovered incredible accidents, injuries, illnesses uh, that you would have missed if you hadn't taken a careful medical history. And particularly, I would say, uh, knowing how to, you know, first of all, don't ask a question if you don't want to know the answer. If you do want to know the answer, then you have to be prepared to really go into it. For example, I'm, we've been together when we've seen a kid and we said, you know, have you ever been knocked unconscious? No, it's never happened, never happened. And well, what kinds of accidents and injuries did you have? Well, I did go through the windshield of the car and I woke up in the hospital. So you have to be willing to just take down what uh, the person said first and then afterwards. And then we then go into, how about bike accidents? How about car? How about roller skin? Have you ever fallen from a high place? So that if you want to know, you have to keep uh, asking. And you have to know how to ask about abuse, which is very important because most of the kids do not want to get their parents in trouble. Uh, so you don't ask, well, did anybody ever abuse you or what? But, uh, you know, I, we would ask, who in the family has a temper? How does it show itself? And then we might ask, uh, do, you think, do you think your mom ever went further than she meant to when she was disciplining you? And by God, that's a terrific question. Oh yeah, there was a time that she beat me with a telephone cord and this and that. Uh, so that the kid or the actually the adult patient would rather blame himself than, than blame a parent. The parents are still uh, pure as the driven snow. But if you blame the kid and say, did you ever drive the person to do more than he meant to, then you find out the most horrendous kinds of things. And then of course, as you remember, we would look at, we'd say, have you, are there any scars? Do you have any scars? Are there any scars I can't see? May I look at your back? May, and if you notice in the, uh, in the movie, it's heartbreaking. You see a child with the back all burned and uh, scarred, and he shows the adult, David Wilson, also. Uh, so you ask, may I look at your back? You know, it's a tricky thing to be allowed to do in a, you know, in a prison, but we manage to do it. Uh, and uh, so, well, that, that would be my advice. If you want to concentrate on something, the other thing is use the medical history to ask about hallucinations and delusions so that you don't say, do you see things other people don't see? Because everyone says, no, what do you think I'm not? But uh, what we will say is have your eyes, how are your eyes, you know, your headaches, this and that, how are your eyes? Uh, do things ever look far away or up close, which has to do with uh, like temporal lobe seizures. And then have your eyes ever played tricks on you? Have you ever seen something and you know it wasn't real? So it's part of a medical question and you do the same with uh, auditory things. You don't say, do you ever hear things that nobody else hears? Because they, they say, what do you think I am, crazy? And instead uh, we'll say, how are your ears? Have you ever had an ear infection? How did your mother treat it? Have your ears ever played tricks on you? And uh, my favorite uh, question, I was taught by a kid who <clears throat> wheeled around and punched another kid for no good reason. And I said, why did you do that? 
And he looked at me and he said, he called me a motherfucker. He had not, I was right there. But I learned from that to say, you ever had the experience of thinking someone said something bad about you or about your mother and you turn around and they say, I didn't do it. it it's a magic question if you want to learn about paranoia. And I, th I think that is the commonest psychotic dis uh, symptom that you see in, in these patients. Mm -hmm. These are great suggestions and you do have an extremely uh, disarming way of interviewing people and making people feel very comfortable. Um, so it's oh, something not, that- not as well as you do, Eva. <laughs> if you would like to share, uh, uh, I mean, you're, you are incredibly blasé when you, uh, I admire you greatly. Uh, Dor Dor Dorothy is referring to a, a very challenging interview that uh, we did in the Bellevue <laughs> in, in, in the locked wards. Um, but I and think it's very, ward. yeah, and the prison ward at Bellevue. But what I do think is important is I think people, as they watch the documentary, should watch your style because you are very non-judgmental, very open. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say warm because that might be inappropriate, but very, very, you really strike a, a nice tone. And I, I, I thought one of the strengths of this documentary is for us to watch that in you and to model after that. And I love the questions that you just gave. Those really detailed questions are so important and establishing rapport. And here you are establishing rapport with you know serial murders. So yeah. it's really an extraordinary movie and I would urge everybody to, to watch it. Um, what struck me watching the movie, having known you so long is, just how you stayed so focused throughout your whole career and so passionate and that even into your 80s you remain so <laughs> enthusiastic and passionate and i think that that's such an extraordinary gift that you have given the world uh to to look at this problem in such depth for so long what is there a, a secret to your success how did how did you do that um it wasn't planned it, uh the uh you know, I had planned to be a psychoanalyst, which I gave up after two years in the Institute, but after a training analysis. Uh, but one thing led to another, to another, to another. And uh, it, it was not pre-planned. Uh, I would say though, that I do not treat those individuals on death row or wherever any differently from the way I treat a patient who walks into my office or from the way I treat you or you treat me. You, you treat a person with interest, curiosity, respect, and uh, you don't lock horns. Uh, that's another thing that I would suggest. You know, we women are pretty good at not locking horns, which may be why they confide in me a bit more. But uh, you don't, the other thing is, if a person tells you one thing like, oh no, I was never abused, and then later they say, oh, I, you say, where'd you get that scar? And they say, well, that's where my father hit me with a board. You do not go back and you don't say, but, but, but you said, you do not uh, kind of question a person on the spot and accuse them. There can be multiple reasons why they didn't think about, uh, about the father hitting them in the head with the uh, board. And, so you don't go back and say, but you didn't, you said this then, but you just follow that up a little bit more and you say, well, and when else did you have an accident? And when else, I noticed you had a little scar on your head. How did you get that? And you don't go back to, oh no, I never had an accident or, oh no, my father never beat me. Forget about it. You've got it. And you, and then later on, look at your notes and see what you've got. Yeah. Fascinating. A, a very non-judgmental um, approach, I think, is what you're you're advocating, which is so important to get people to feel comfortable and open up. Uh, absolutely, but uh -huh. isn't that true with all of our interactions? I mean, you and I are not talking that differently from the way you and I talked on the prison ward at Bellevue. I remember you very clearly, and you were you were gentle. You were concerned and you were unflappable which uh i think you you deserve a medal for that 
Perhaps we'll share that. Perhaps we'll share that with Gina and Elizabeth later on. As as far as unflappable goes, one of the questions that I had when I watched the movie was, "Have you been threatened?" Um, in your career. I, I know there was one point in the movie when they talked about the, the radio jingle uh, that was a, a direct put down, mm. but I was wondering, <laughs> have you had other incidents in your professional life? I, I know I have had mine and I've had mm. a, certainly a, 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 I think a much easier population to deal with, but yet when you become a public figure, you expose yourself. So I was wondering how you've handled that. Uh. I'm not sure yet. You ask it at a very important point because a few days ago, uh, I was contacted by somebody who then became enraged on the telephone that he couldn't reach me. And uh, you, the person had sent me a very long missive uh, and uh, I had to figure out what did I want to do? Did I want to... Uh, did I want to get some protection? And, or did I want to see if I could handle it myself? And I, I handled it myself. I, I wrote back a, a caring kind of short email and that was that. That is scary when you, get, uh, when you get threats from outside and you don't know who it is. The other thing I would advise is anyone who goes into the field that I've gone into, for God's sake, don't go into a room alone, locked up alone with a recurrently violent or even occasionally violent individual. Because, uh, you know, I used to think, oh, no, if I'm nice, they'll be nice to me. Forget it. Uh, some of them can turn on a dime. Mm. Sometimes you can say something that you don't realize is provocative, but because they have an association to it, there is suddenly an angry response. So that, uh, again, my advice to, to males and females is don't go in alone. Go in with somebody. I like to go in with a, with a lawyer because I like the lawyer to see what I see. And uh, so I, it's like two birds where I also have the security. Mm -hmm. Excellent. What would you do in your office or, or in the hospital setting? The, oh, same thing. The other thing is, uh, there's a big debate. I, don't, I, I remember Mel wanted me to sit behind a desk and the patient, uh, I forget what it was, but uh, um, I guess I always like the patient, even in a, on a regular VA ward or whatever, I like the person to have a beeline for the door if they can, because uh, then if the choice is I wish to hit her or I need to get out of here, they can get out. If they have to walk over you to get to the door, you're in a lot more trouble. So you really need to, uh, you need to think about that. And uh, you know, and if you are uneasy about it, leave the door open or go in with somebody else. Uh, but for goodness sake, don't be superwoman or whatever. But it, it sounds like for most of your career, you felt pretty safe. Yes. Uh, right. But you know, uh, stupidly, I think, because most of my career, I did not really believe that these dissociative disorders existed. So I didn't realize that someone could turn on a dime that way. So I think it was out of naivete that I could go in alone and I wasn't scared or what have you. Uh, and only later when I saw that a person, I've had this happen in a session where suddenly a person changed and became very threatening. Fortunately, I was there with Kathy and we talked him down. But, uh, well, Kathy had said to me, Dorothy, I'm never doing this with you again. Uh, mm -hmm. But she changed her mind and we do it together all the, all the time. But it did happen. <laughs> it did happen. And I was so glad she was there. I really right. Was. Right. Yeah. Pretty scary. Um, what other thoughts do you want to leave our listeners with? Mm. 
It's a tough one. Mm -hmm. uh, now you've given them a lot. How about we show them your book behind you? Is that your book right there? Where? Let me let me see. If by, your, by your Guilty. brain. I oh, think my that's brain your book fun. right there. Yes, but isn't I, that I your keep book? an extra brain. I keep an extra brain. <laughs> Uh, here is, here, is, uh, uh, there you go. Is here is uh, guilty by reason of insanity. And yes. uh, uh, I, I'm told it's a good read. Uh, and uh, oh, wait, you'll meet some of the people in here that you saw. For example, Johnny Garrett, I think, might be in here. Uh, oh, and Shawcross is in here. So, uh, Actually, he was very, very hard to write about. Uh, so uh, it should be fun <laughs> if that kind of book is fun. So people who are intrigued by the documentary, the next step would be to get your book. I, I can't say that. I'd say the next step would be, I would look at the, uh, the movie again. Do you know, uh, Eva, when I first saw the movie, uh -huh. the doc, I was traumatized. I would, and I don't, I don't, I can't say why exactly, huh. but I spaced and I've never to the best of my knowledge done that before, but I was so shaken by it that uh, I didn't remember it. And when I got back to, I saw it in Alex's studio because the festival had been canceled. And when I got back to my house, I called him and I said, Alex, was there a drawing of an electric chair, the back of an electric chair uh, in the movie? And he said, Dorothy, not only was there a drawing of that, but you were in it. And not only were you in it, but you were also watching it. And not only were you watching it, but you were already the executioner. If you recall toward the end of the film, he uses that. And I think, that that picture, you know, I had talked with him about having fantasized myself seated there or identified with Ethel Rosenberg, who was executed. But uh, I was so traumatized by it that I couldn't remember it. Wow, that's incredible. Uh, so you think it was that scene in the movie that distressed you? I, I think it was that and also that unbelievably painful scene of the person putting the quarters into the slot in order to execute a dummy behind the screen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, uh, that that really jarred me. Uh, if you recall it, I, it was indelibly imprinted on my mind. That I remembered. There's a, you'll see there at some kind of a, I don't know, a mall or whatever, and they put a quarter in, they can pull the handle and electrocute a, a dummy there and the legs shake and the heads shake and he does it over and over again mm -hmm. and i think a combination of that with that very last scene with the sketches mm -hmm. of the right uh, of the electric chair and of me in every one of those roles uh, i think it shook me up right that's understandable so you've watched it again yes absolutely uh -huh. Uh -huh. And what did you take away when you saw it again? Uh, I missed a lot. And uh -huh. I saw it again before I before this. I saw it yesterday. And I was first able to recognize the incredible artistry of Alex. And it blew me away because, uh, oh, when, when we, in it, I talked a little bit about Janae, who thought that, the mind had streams running one above another, above another in terms of layers of consciousness. And Alex had shown a person, a face with a shadow behind it and another shadow and another shadow kind of rippling down. And uh, so I was able to uh, just marvel at his artistry mm -hmm. and also at the, the drawings that his son did uh, do you remember this really uh, frightening drawings of how a child imagines things and how the uh, the Rorschach morphed into these uh, mm -hmm. demons? So, uh, so I could I could look at the artistry yesterday. It's beautiful. Yeah, you're so humble. <laughs> uh, 
right? We're talking about the movie and what an incredible life you've had and this enormous impact and how you've worked your whole life to get people to see violent people in a different light and to understand that there's antecedents to it and to try to treat them with compassion. And here you are talking about the movie and all you can do is praise the other people in the movie, uh, Alex, his son. Yeah. So I think, I think that's part of your genius is your humility. And you're able to go into to all these different situations with such a humbleness and an openness that uh, you, know, you, you, you probably uh, you, you did it too. Wait till you, you tell them. This you stuff. probably made Alex, you know, have such a good time with this documentary. He must have thought you were so easy to work with, right? I think that he was interested in how my mind worked. Yeah, uh, absolutely. It, uh, yeah. Well, thank you for sharing so much with us today, Dorothy. It's a pleasure. And I'm oh, so proud so of you. And I hope that lots of people will see this movie and that it will spark lots of conversations and that the next generation will make these shifts that you're talking about to treat everybody in a more humane and compassionate fashion and work together to to end some of this this early trauma that leads to these terrible consequences for so many people. Thank, Thank you for you your so time much. today. You. you have wonderful questions. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know what? One thing maybe they can splice it back in is there was no women in the movie. Um, do you want to say a little something about women and violence? And we can maybe splice oh, it back sure. in. But no. if we can't, um, we can't. Well, uh, every statistic that I've looked at, and you periodically look at them, uh, men seem to be nine times as violent as women. They certainly commit 90% of the crimes and certainly of the violent crimes. So that uh, you do see fewer, uh, you know, fewer women. The other thing is that often uh, women will be looked at in a gentler way and people will wonder what made her so crazy that she did what she did. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're a man and you do it, uh, they just think you're, you're a rotten person. Uh, I have seen, um, gee, I, I've only seen two or three female murderers. Uh, do you know what's interesting, Eva? Both of them, uh, yeah, both of them refused to allow me to make public what had happened to them. And uh, one of them, preferred to, to be executed uh, uh, rather than have, have me tell what had happened to her and with her family. Because she said if she told me, then they'd be mad and they wouldn't come to visit her on death row. Uh, so that I, I have very little experience with women, but I have had two or three uh, who have, oh yeah, maybe more. Uh, and. Uh, I don't know enough about them to, to say very much. Uh, okay. And in the movie, Max gets out. What happened with Max? Okay, well, I wondered that very thing. And uh, I'm not sure whom I asked, perhaps his uh, lawyer or whatever. And I heard that he was in another hospital. And this was a few months later. And I found out where it was because I heard he was very, very sick. And so I went to see him. And mm. uh, I think I went with one or two of my students and he was dying and uh, he sort of knew me. And I said goodbye to all of him. You know, I, I spoke to Max and I spoke to Jabril and I spoke to Cocky, the heart, you know, Cocky was the other one. And, uh, you know, I, I just spoke with them. I said, I was so sorry, I couldn't help the war. And uh, I'm told not long thereafter he died. Oh, how sad. Yeah. That's very sad. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And then one last question, which is you, you or Alex chose to show your charcoaling. Can you tell us more about your charcoaling? How long that's been a hobby? Oh, oh. Uh, Oh, for uh, three or four years, there was a wonderful teacher here at the uh, uh, at the Creative Arts Workshop, and 
I had, well, I had always wanted to know how to just draw the human figure, that or how to draw a horse. And there was no course in how to draw a horse. So, uh, so I took his course and then he retired and I stopped. But I, I liked doing it, it was wonderful. Is it important for, for doctors to have some kind of outlet like that? You know, even I've only lived with me. Uh -huh. uh, and, and that was just for about three or four years, once a week. Uh, you know, I don't know that. You know, my outlet probably had to be being home, being a mother, being a wife, whatever. Uh, uh -huh. I don't think you can generalize that way. Uh, it, it's not that easy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are there other hobbies that you've had throughout the years? Yeah, I guess. Uh, my husband was very into antique maps. And so uh, I can endlessly paw through like uh, at a flea market. If there's a place that has old antique maps, I, I would like to look at those. But uh, no, I, I can't think of any particular uh, mm -hmm. area. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you treat people pretty much the same way as you treat anyone else, it isn't as if you're different when you go to see them from when you come home. It isn't like saying, oh, thank God I'm done. It. It, oh, I see. So, right. OK, I like that. Yeah, yeah. So you didn't have a different persona at work and at home? No. Same no. you, right? Well, you, you know me. You, you, you saw the movie and how I am with them. And we yeah. knew each other. And we're talking yeah. very much the way I talk yeah. with, uh, you know. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but I guess what I've never seen is you with your children. I saw uh, you with Mel. Uh -huh. You didn't see me with uh, Julian and Eric, no? No. Uh, well, uh, maybe the funniest and perhaps the most grotesque is, uh, do you remember we used to try to do videotapes, teaching tapes in our own amateurish way at, maybe it was later that we did that. And uh, I would come home and uh, Eric is handier at certain things certainly than I am. And so I would he would try to help me uh, edit and, uh, I used to pick the student with the most beautiful voice to do the background, uh, you know, the narrative. Well, Eric couldn't stand it. He just couldn't stand it. And so Jillian came and Jillian helped me edit the tapes. It, uh, <laughs> Eric was traumatized by them. Yeah. Uh, and oh, I'll, t I'll yeah. tell you one other thing. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, my grandson would hear us talk or, or here and there. And when he was in pre-kindergarten, uh, his teacher went up to Jillian, to my daughter, and she said, Jillian, could you please tell Noah not to talk about serial killers? That's <laughs> 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 true. <laughs> Only you could tell that story. <laughs> well, that's funny. It, it happened. Uh, yeah. So one thing that's been unusual about your career is you've been able to talk about famous people by name. Um, how is that that you've been able to release that sort of information like Ted Bundy or Shawcross? Um, is that because it's already in the legal system so that you're allowed to, to share that information? Well, uh, I guess most of it is already in the public domain, but the public mm -hmm. doesn't know it. For example, uh, with Johnny Garrett, uh, my whole interview for hours was uh, shown to the clemency board so that he was uh, right out there. Uh, but also uh, whoever we, uh, whoever, whomever we showed, uh, would be a person who had given us written permission or tape recorded verbal permission to use his or her uh, interviews for these kinds of purposes. So that uh, it was either in the public domain and or we had their permission. In, oh, uh, if you saw there was a little girl in the 
in the film. And with her, I said, we need to get her permission. And uh, she had contacted me years after I had treated her. And she had said she was very grateful because she was a whole lot better. And so I contacted her and she gave me written permission and she gave Alex written permission to use tapes of her. Wow. So that, uh, that's Amazing. how it and that's it for episode 161 of the Sightcast by MD Edge. The Sightcast is produced by MD Edge editors Gina Henderson and Jeff Bauer. All of our podcasts are produced by MD Edge executive editor Kathy Scarbeck. Our guest host and our host can be found more available in the show notes. The show notes are authored by Dr. Jacqueline Posada. 